The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode, unmuted. Good morning, everyone. My name is John DeBella, and on behalf of Simulations Plus and Electrolab India, I welcome you to today's webinar, where we will discuss how you can utilize in silico inputs to inform your Gastro Plus mechanistic absorption PBPK models. Michael Lawless, our senior principal scientist, will be speaking today. An opportunity to ask questions will take place at the end of Michael's presentation. You may either type your question using the questions pane on your control panel, or you may ask your question directly using the hand raising icon. This webinar is being recorded for playback at the online resource center on our website, www.simulations-plus.com. Also, upon request, the presentation slides can be made available and shared with colleagues. It is now my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Michael. Michael? Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, thank you for taking the time out uh, to uh, watch this uh, uh, video or webinar and demonstration. Um, this next slide is simply a um, kind of an overview of Simulations Plus, just to introduce you. We are a publicly traded uh, company. Our uh, symbol is SLP, and we're on the NASDAQ. Uh, we were incorporated in 1996. Uh, we're a software development company with expertise in PBPK modeling and simulation and QSAR modeling. And uh, we invest 12% of our revenue back into research and development. About three or four years ago, we uh, purchased a company called Cognigen in uh, Buffalo, New York. Uh, they were incorporated in 1992. They're also a software development company with expertise in pharmacometrics. Uh, services and population PK and PD data analysis. And then uh, a little over a year ago, we purchased a company called uh, Dilly Sim, which is in North Carolina. Uh, it was incorporated in 2015, and they uh, do systems uh, pharmacology and toxicology modeling. Uh, and Dilly Sim uh, is one of the products that looks at uh, drug induced liver injury. And uh, total, we have about 100 employees here. Um, uh, Simulations Plus uh, covers end-to-end -end, uh, modeling and simulation solutions. So we can start in uh, early discovery uh, with our product AdMet predictor, along with MedChem Studio, uh, can uh, analyze uh, data sets, high-throughput screening data sets, and uh, 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 help willow those down to selected hits that can then be expanded uh, into leads. And, uh, of course, as you, you go along, it's very important to take a look at the AdMet properties and predict AdMet properties as well as measure them experimentally once you've synthesized the compounds uh, and then filter them uh, together. Uh, as you move into the preclinical area, uh, this is where Gastro Plus starts uh, to take over uh, with uh, uh, subsequent uh, other programs such as DDD Plus, uh, which looks at drug dissolution, and Membrane Plus, which looks at uh, compounds going through a, a membrane. Uh, uh, as you move further into clinical trial or preclinical animal species and clinical trials, uh, you can use PK Plus along with Dilly Sim and uh, other programs provided by Simulations Plus. Our consulting services and collaborations covers all of these areas uh, from discovery all the way through clinical trials. Uh, this next slide is simply an outline of the talk. Uh, so I'm going to start with discussing the inputs into Gastro Plus and kind of give the overall picture of Gastro Plus. Then I'm going to talk about QSAR modeling and QSPR modeling. Uh, th this will be followed by specifics on our physical, chemical, and biopharmaceutical module and the models in, in, those, in that module, along with the uh, metabolism module, and I'll, here I'll focus on cytochrome P450 metabolism. And then finally, I'll bring this all together and talk about how these uh, models are integrated into PBPK modeling uh, in Gastro Plus. Uh, so this is overall the, the big picture into Gastro Plus. Uh, 
Gastro Plus can look at dissolution and absorption, plasma concentration or plasma and tissue concentration profiles, uh, nonlinear kinetics, and drug drug interactions, along with PBPK and pharmacodynamic modeling. So, what kind of inputs can go into Gastro Plus? Well, if we start up here in the upper left hand corner, uh, we see in silico and in vitro experiments. And uh, this talk mostly focuses on the in silico predictions of uh, physical chemical properties such as uh, jejunal permeability, aqueous water solubility, pKa, log P, uh, fraction unbound to plasma, and the ratio of blood to plasma concentrations. Of course, you can also measure these in vitro if you've made the compound. Uh, the advantage, one advantage of in silico is you can perform these simulations uh, and use these predictions before you even synthesize the compound. Uh, this gets fed into Gastro Plus, so these properties along with the uh, dose, dosage form, particle size, and release profile uh, can give you a really good estimate of your dissolution and absorption. Uh, when you start to add in uh, kinetics uh, in the liver, uh, then you can uh, uh, start looking at nonlinear kinetics and drug-drug interactions. Over on the right-hand side, uh, this relies on kind of IV and oral PK data that can be read in and uh, used in PK plus to predict volume of distribution, so PK plus is a module within Gastro plus, uh, clearance and some uh, rate constants. Uh, PBPK plus can be used uh, or can take the uh, clearance as the input uh, and then again give plasma tissue concentrations. Uh, and then as you synthesize your compound and you start looking at therapeutic and adver adverse uh, effect data, uh, you can perform PD modeling with Gastro plus. Uh, so this uh, next slide is kind of an overview of, of what's happening in vivo. So here we would have uh, the, the, the GI tract along this way, the, the gut wall, portal vein going into the liver, and then systemic circulation. So if we take a, an orally dose drug that would uh, dissolve in the stomach and then start working its way down the GI tract. And so the type properties we would be interested in here are PKA solubility versus pH because uh, the pH in the uh, stomach is a much lower pH uh, than it is as uh, the rest of the, the GI tract and this would allow the compound to dissolve uh, in this kind of acidic environment and so the solubility versus pH is a very important um, uh, curve or plot. Uh, we also predict biorelevant solubility so these would be uh, both facet and fessive uh, uh, simulated uh, gastric and intestinal fluids. Uh, you're also looking at precipitation kinetics uh, in this area. Uh, once the compound is uh, dissolved, it can be absorbed uh, into the gut wall. And just as soon as it enters the gut wall, the enterocytes uh, on the other side, uh, this is termed the fraction absorbed of the compound. Uh, there is metabolism that can occur uh, in the gut wall. There's uh, not only cytochrome P450, but uh, UGTs that can metabolize the compound. And later on, when I demonst uh, demonstrate Gastro Plus, I'll show how you can use uh, SIP, KM, and VMAX values to simulate uh, uh, metabolism in the gut wall. Uh, it's, uh, to enter the gut wall, uh, it's important to look at transcellular permeability. So this is uh, the compound going in one side of the cell and coming out of the other side of the cell. Very small molecules can uh, uh, absorb between the cells. So they don't go in the, um, in the cells, they actually go in between the cells. This is called paracellular permeability and occurs for small molecules. And that's also incorporated into Gastro Plus. Uh, log D versus pH is important in here because you're looking at absorption uh, of the molecule and permeability into the gut wall. And uh, so it uh, depends highly on the log D of the compound. Uh, we also look at carrier mediated transport and gut extraction. So this is the metabolism of the gut. Uh, once the compound goes through the gut wall, it will enter the, the, the portal vein, uh, and this is termed the uh, fraction DP, or the fraction delivered into the portal vein. And so if FDP is less than uh, FA, that means that uh, metabolism is occurring in the gut wall. 
then the molecule will enter uh, the, the liver where there's uh, quite a bit of metabolism going on, not only uh, UGTs and um, cytochrome P450, but uh, other enzymes that will metabolize the compound. Uh, when it's in, uh, so we consider liver metabolism, so we have models that predict uh, uh, clearance or, or metabolism in the liver. Uh, hepatic uptake would occur from transporters uh, uh, on the outside of the liver that point towards the blood supply. So when it comes down to blood supply, uh, it can be taken into the uh, liver. And then also biliary secretion can occur uh, in the liver to clear the compound. Once the compound goes uh, through the liver, it would go into systemic circulation. And this would be termed the oral bioavailability of the compound. So it's the uh, percent of the dose that goes through all the way out into systemic circulation. And it's important not to confuse this with the fraction absorbed. Um, once it gets into systemic circulation, uh, we can plot things like the plasma uh, concentration profile as shown here. Uh, uh, once it's in systemic circulation, we look at plasma protein binding, the blood to plasma concentration ratio, uh, tissue distribution, and then systemic clearance, for example, uh, clearance uh, that uh, the kidneys would contribute to the systemic clearance. This next slide, uh, it just kind of briefly describes ADMET Predictor. Uh, it's a complete ADMET property uh, prediction and data mining platform. Uh, here we have a couple of screenshots here, and I'll demonstrate uh, ADMET Predictor on a small, just a single molecule to calculate the properties. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of uh, things you can do with ADMET Predictor, and this just shows some um, uh, heat maps, graphs, uh, et cetera, within the, the interface. Uh, this is now as um, an, um, um, an R group analysis where you can kind of look at uh, a, a, a scaffold and then the R groups are listed both as the columns and the rows and then you can make nice graphics of various properties. For example, here we're plotting uh, PIC50, the compound. AdMet Predictor has over 140 uh, key absorption distribution metabolism uh, elimination and toxicity uh, properties that are predicted. Very nice uh, interface to allow for easy identification of patterns of compound libraries and a suite of medicinal chemistry tools to assist in lead optimization. And so I'll demonstrate that uh, program later. Uh, the main focus of this talk is uh, using QSAR models uh, in PBPK modeling. And uh, so I'm, uh, this section here I'll discuss how we generate these QSAR models. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I think it's important to understand what goes into the QSAR models and uh, what kind of approximations are made here. Uh, basically, the, you're using a QSAR model to take the 2D structure of a molecule and predict various properties, such as log P, PK, uh, aqueous solubility, et cetera. And uh, in order to do this, you need to start with a data set of known compounds. So this is machine learning. Uh, it takes uh, data from uh, experiments and analyzes them and creates a model. And then that model can be used to predict other properties. And the way that's done is to take the compounds and break them down into descriptors. So descriptors are just um, uh, uh, pieces or um, properties of the molecule, for example, log P could be a descriptor of the molecule, or the count of oxygen atoms or nitrogen atoms, or kind of the shape of the molecule or the number of aromatic rings, etc. cetera. And um, uh, so first you would break down each or calculate the descriptors for each of the molecules, and then you'd use different training algorithms. And I've listed um, five algorithms here, multiple linear regression, partial least squares, artificial neural network ensembles, random forest, and support vector machines. And so these algorithms can combine the um, descriptors and generate a mathematical model that will allow you to predict uh, various endpoints uh, that you've trained the model on. Uh, our favorite method or the method we use mostly is artificial neural network uh, ensemble. Uh, 
here on this slide, I list keys to creating good models. And the first one is to curate your data. So even if it's um, internal data that's been generated by your own lab, uh, there can be problems with uh, the experiments. So it's important to kind of analyze the data and make sure that um, uh, it, it, it makes sense uh, so that the units are correct, uh, et cetera. Uh, we, uh, Gather, gather a lot of data from the public domain. And so it's very important for us to uh, examine the uh, structures, the data, the units on the data. And uh, if we have uh, two measurements, say, from different labs and those disagree, we need to uh, somehow rectify those, uh, either by taking an average or um, eliminate one or the other. So the very first thing to do with your data is curate your data. So for example, if you have bad data going into the model, you're not going to get a very accurate model uh, coming out. Uh, also using appropriate and accurate descriptors. So uh, we have a base of over 300 descriptors we use to create the models. Uh, we also have what are called atomic descriptors, and we have over 120 of those uh, that would uh, are just used for a single atom. And I'll discuss that more when I talk about the sites of metabolism and the PKA predictions. Uh, we pre-filter our descriptors, so the descriptor space can be very complex, and uh, you want to reduce the redundancy in the descriptor space, so uh, it's important to eliminate uh, redundant descriptors. Uh, of a very important factor that kind of goes also with the overtrain is to validate on external test sets. So uh, it's important to leave some compounds out of your, your, your uh, training set, uh, and then apply your model to these ex uh, this external test set. And um, the, the reason you do that is to avoid overtraining. So if you produce a model that is has excellent statistics on the training set, but then when you apply it to an external test set and you have poor performance, uh, that would be uh, an overtrained model. Uh, using good training algorithms, and again, I mentioned the artificial neural network ensemble is our uh, favorite. And then also using wisdom of the cloud. So I mentioned we use an ensemble. So we not only use one artificial neural network, we use 33 artificial neural networks and take uh, an average of those to kind of uh, uh, reduce any noise uh, from any individual ensemble or network. Uh, this is just an overview of how we build our artificial neural network ensemble models. So we start with uh, structures and data, and again, we go through a heavy curation process. Uh, the, the program automatically computes over 300 descriptors. Uh, here is kind of a, how these would be subsetted into uh, six different categories. Uh, so once the descriptors are calculated, you basically have uh, an array where the rows are the uh, molecules, you're going to have a column with your uh, biological activity or your endpoint, and then various descriptors. Again, we have over 300 descriptors. Uh, then this is the kind of the pre-filtering of the descriptors. So the first thing we would do is remove low uh, low variance and correlated descriptors. So if a descriptor is basically the same for all the molecules, <coughs> excuse me, it's not going to be helpful in uh, uh, discerning any differences in the biological activity. So if there's low variance in there, we would drop that. And then we compare every uh, descriptor to all the other descriptors. And if two descriptors are highly correlated, we would drop one of those descriptors. Uh, next, we create a test set, and we have multiple methods for creating that test set. And then this is set aside and sequestered. The rest of the molecules go into the training set and used in the training algorithm. A priority, we don't know how many neurons and descriptors are going to create the best model, so we create a grid of different model architectures. So these are different number of neurons and different number of descriptors for each one of the cells in this grid. And we perform a sensitivity analysis to determine what descriptors could create the best model. So for example, if we're going to create a 10 neuron, or excuse me, a one neuron, 10 uh, descriptor model, and we've got 150 descriptors, we use the sensitivity analysis method to kind of pre-select uh, the 10 best and uh, build the model from there. 
uh, once we've uh, built all these models, we have an algorithm to kind of select the best model based on the statistics. And uh, again, this is an artificial neural network ensemble. And this is kind of a cartoon of a, a neural network. So the, um, uh, the red triangles are the descriptor values, and then these are multiplied by a coefficient and summed up in the neurons, and then each neuron is multiplied by a coefficient and summed up in the output neuron here. Um, this is a list of the models in the physical, chemical, and biopharmaceutical module. So I'll start up here at the top. Uh, we have a PKA module, and uh, I'll talk, or, excuse me, model. And I'll talk more in depth about that on, on the following slides. Uh, we have a very accurate log P model and a log D model. The log D model takes, uh, uh, uses the log P model along with the PKA of the compound to look at the uh, variance at the pH. A uh, diffusion coefficient, which is also used in, in Gastro Plus. Uh, air water partition coefficient, and then we've got a couple uh, transporter models, and uh, I'll show where these are shown in uh, Gastro Plus. We have uh, several uh, solubility models. A lot of them are based on the aqueous solubility model. And for this model, we're looking at the thermodynamic solubility of the compound. So it would start, the experiments are performed on the pure crystal structure of the molecule. Uh, so it's not a salt. And then uh, it's dissolved in pure water. So there's no buffers in the water. And uh, as you add more and more of this compound and shake and stir, uh, you're going to uh, eventually uh, form a saturated solution, and that's the uh, solubility of the compound. Now, if that compound has uh, ionizable groups, then the pH of that saturated solution will be something other than uh, 7.0. And so we would predict that, again, with our um, uh, solubility and our uh, pKa model. Uh, we also predict the solubility at a given pH, and these are how we create our solubility versus pH profiles. We calculate the intrinsic solubility, which is the uh, neutral so uh, the solubility of the, the unionized compound. Uh, the salt solubility factor is the difference between the intrinsic uh, solubility or the solubility of the neutral and the fully uh, ionized uh, compound. Uh, we also calculate super, the tendency to supersaturate, and then we have three models to predict uh, solubility in simulated gastric and intestinal, intestinal fluids. Uh, these particular models were created by outsourcing experiments uh, to university uh, that performed these experiments, uh, gave us the data back, and then we uh, created the models. Uh, so those are kind of proprietary uh, experiments that we use there. We also have a number of uh, pharmacokinetic models, so human and rat plasma protein binding. Uh, so these are incorporated into the new Gastro Plus 9.6. Uh, rat plasma, rat and human plasma, uh, blood to plasma ratio, volume of distribution, uh, fraction unbound to microsomes. This is used uh, to correct our uh, experimental um, uh, liver microsomal data for uh, um, the unbound fraction of the molecule. Uh, some of the new models in AdMet Predictor 9.0 are the extended cl clearance classification system. So this classifies <coughs> excuse me, each compound's uh, major clearance pathway is either renal, um, metabolism, or hepatic uptake. Uh, from this uh, uh, data set, uh, we built individual clearance mechanisms, so we have binary models to predict uh, renal, hepatic uptake, or metabolism. We also have a ternary model uh, to predict this. Uh, also in AdMet Predictor uh, 9.0, we will display the, the uh, biopharmaceutical classification system and developability classification system and graphical display. And I'll try and show that when I demo, demonstrate AdMet Predictor. Uh, uh, permeability, we have several permeability models. One of the most important is the, the PEF model, which is the human jejunal permeability. Uh, and that plays a very important factor in Gastro Plus in predicting the fraction absorbed molecule. Uh, so we, we we spend a lot of time on our PKA model, and uh, we have one of the we have the best model uh, 
uh, out there. Uh, and the reason the PKA, uh, we spent so much time on the PKA model is because many other properties are directly affected by ionization. So uh, lipophilicity, solubility, permeability, metabolism, uh, mediated carrier mediated transporter, all are dependent upon the ionization of the compound. So an accurate PKA model uh, is a prerequisite in achieving accuracy in many of the other models. Uh, we had a collaboration uh, several years ago with Bayer Pharmaceuticals, and that allowed us to expand the uh, our, our data set. So in this slide, we're comparing the data set or comparing predictions made on 981 Bayer uh, compounds with uh, ACD Percepta, AVMAP Predictor 6.1, and then AVMAP Predictor uh, version 9. So this is when we incorporated this new model. So this is the number of training compounds, and then this is the um, our original model from 6.1 plus about 20,000 uh, points uh, from Bayer compounds. And so here, the main thing maybe to look at is the root mean square error. So our uh, 6.1 model was actually a little bit better, performed a little bit better on this data set than ACD, both in the uh, lower root mean square and a little bit higher R squared. Uh, but then when we added this and rebuilt all these models, uh, we got the root mean square error down to 0.67 and the R squared all the way up to 0.93. So uh, this is really an excellent model. And uh, it's with, um, that was developed a, a few years ago. Uh, just recently, I'll show a slide where uh, this model uh, came in uh, first in a, a particular cha challenge. Uh, so these are just uh, observed versus predicted plots for our PK model, uh, log P, and uh, water solubility model. Uh, and you see each one of these data sets have a large number of compounds. Uh, we do show these graphs for every model uh, in, in our manual. So if you want to look at any individual models, how many compounds, and what this uh, plot looks like, those are available in our model. Uh, now, this slide simply just lists some, some data set sizes of our key properties. Uh, PK, aqueous solubility, and log P, as I showed on the previous slide, uh, the data sets are thousands of compounds. For plasma protein binding and blood to plasma ratio, these are hundreds of compounds. I think our plasma protein comp, uh, data sets uh, almost up to a thousand. Uh, compounds here, and we also have a, a, a rat uh, uh, plasma protein binding model. The SIP metabolism models are a little bit smaller. Uh, once I get into that, I'll show you that we have uh, models that predict uh, KMV max and clearance. Those are typically hundreds of compounds. The uh, HLM clearance and RLM clearance are hundreds, uh, I think 500 and, and over 1,000 compounds for the HLM clearance model. Uh, a number of uh, external uh, groups have looked at these um, uh, physical chemical properties and um, AdMet predictors models uh, are best in class as verified by these independent uh, researchers. So this was the first independent comparison of log P and uh, QMPR plus was the former name of AdMet predictor and, and it ranked very highly. So this is the percent of compounds uh, with errors less than 0.5 and uh, AdMet predictor ranked first in this study. Uh, this study was on a, a not the, the largest data set, but 234 compounds, 50, 18, and 266. Uh, AdMet predictor ranked uh, number one uh, across these uh, four data sets. Uh, this third uh, uh, publication is for again for log P, and this is a very large data set. So this is Pfizer uh, data set, almost 100,000 compounds, and then a smaller set of about 1,000 compounds here. And again, you'll see that uh, AdMet predictor ranked very highly, uh, along with this A, A log PS. Uh, model. Uh, if you look in a little bit more detail, you see that we get uh, the larger percent of molecules with a small error range here. So we're a little bit better than uh, this A log P model. I also want to note uh, that um, we used uh, the M log P model, or the, the, the um, uh, authors here uh, used our simulations plus, S plus, since for simulations plus, uh, and used our model of log P. So we also have this M log P 
uh, model in AdMap Predictor, and uh, it ranked pretty good second. Now you'll note that someone else submitted uh, an MLOG P model, and they used Dragon descriptors uh, to create this. You'll note that our model came out a, a lot better, a lot lower RMSE. So it's also important to create uh, good descriptors, and we uh, kind of illustrate there with uh, our MLOG P model um, gave much better uh, predictions than the Dragon descriptors for that same one. Uh, this uh, publication was on solubility. Uh, again, Simulations Plus came in top. Let me go back one. Sorry, I moved that too quickly. So again, 64% with a, a, a low log P, or uh, less than a log, half a log off, and then 91% uh, within a, a, a one log unit of the uh, solubility. That's a very hard property to predict, solubility. Uh, this slide just illustrates really how good our uh, modeling algorithms are in our descriptors. So uh, in this uh, uh, publication, the authors uh, challenged uh, modelers to produce models of, uh, uh, in, of, of solubility, and uh, we submitted eight models from Simulations Plus. Uh, there were a total of 99 submissions, and our eight models came uh, in the top 12. Uh, for that, and these uh, 12 are listed here. Now, this isn't in any uh, particular order. You'll see that uh, Chem Silico uh, listed first here as an R squared of 0.35. Well, you see that that a lot of our models uh, out outperform that, and also have lower RMSEs. Uh, this uh, was a second uh, comparison of solubility predictors. Uh, it compares the shows that the test. Uh, model and AdMap predictor gave the best performance here. <coughs> and then uh, uh, this slide, I just want to point out this over here to the right. Uh, this is a recent uh, samples PKA challenge uh, where AdMap predictor's PKA model actually uh, turned out on top. This is a little bit uh, older slide. I think when we, uh, this was revised, we actually came out on top uh, against several of our competitors. And also some of these uh, um, models are from very high level ab initio calculations. Uh, and of course, they, they probably took a lot longer than AdMet Predictor. AdMet Predictor can really calculate uh, PKAs very quickly as I'll, I'll show just on calculating one simple model. Okay, now let's move on to uh, cytochrome P450, uh, and this is our metabolism module within uh, AdMet Predictor. Uh, so this slide just illustrates the how the top uh, 200 drugs are metabolized. Over on the left, we see a plot of the enzymes metabolizing these top 200 compounds. About three quarters of the uh, uh, drugs are metabolized by SIPs, uh, a little smaller percent uh, of UGTs, and then esterases is even a smaller fraction here. Of the SIPs, uh, the five major SIPs are 1A2, 2C9, 2C19, 2D6, and 3A4, which metabolizes about half the compounds of the top 200 drugs. Uh, they're smaller proportions from 2B6 and 2E1, and we have both those models also included in MMET predictor. So what we wanted to do was uh, predict sites of metabolism uh, on these molecules, and that's what's illustrated in, in this slide. Uh, so the first step was to collect and curate uh, data from various li uh, databases, literature compilations, and various literature articles. Uh, so we purchased what was called the uh, Accelerus Metabolite Database at the, at the time. It was formerly the Simex Database. Uh, it's now been bought by Biovia, uh, which owns this uh, database. So that was the starting point. Uh, we also used uh, data from Sheridan's uh, JMED Chem. Uh, article in 2007. So this database is uh, uh, just was a compilation of literature, uh, 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 parent and metabolites. They also listed the SIPs that could contribute that contributed to that. And when we started building models, uh, we looked at the false negatives and false positives of the model, and then would go back and uh, review the literature. And we did find a number of mistakes uh, in this metabolite database. And one of the common ones uh, would be the in the literature, it would say uh, this molecule was um, 
metabolized by CYP1A2 and 3A uh, 2D6, for example, uh, to produce metabolites A and B, respectively. And a lot of times, the um, whoever was putting this in the database, instead of assigning um, 1A2 to, to uh, metabolite A and 2D6 to metabolite B, they would assign um, both those SIPs to both those products uh, incorrectly. So that would create uh, uh, false positives, essentially. Uh, next, we uh, classified the atoms of the molecules as metabolized or not metabolized based on the observed metabolites. So here we're just basically building our uh, data set and input into the uh, model. Uh, we generated atomic descriptors for each atom. And then we build uh, artificial neural network ensembles to predict the site's metabolism. Uh, so here, each row in the spreadsheet, instead of a molecule, each row is an individual atom in the molecule. And then there's a column that indicates uh, if this is a site of metabolism or not. So we built uh, uh, nine uh, sites of metabolism models for these uh, major SIPs here. Each candidate receives a score. And then the highest scoring atoms are classified as sites of metabolism. So this is an illustration of a particular, just a single molecule, propranolol, from uh, these two experimental or these two journal articles. Uh, so propranolol is uh, hydroxylated in two positions on the naphthalene ring. by 2D6, and then this isopropyl group is hydroxylated in the middle carbon, and then this is an unstable intermediate, so it would um, decompose into this, this amine here. Uh, so we would take this data, and we would break this molecule into the individual atoms, and then we would identify the sites, so these are identified in red, and then the gray are the non-sites, and so that would create our, our table. And then we would create a classification model that predicted yes or no if this is a site of, of metabolism. Then those would get scores, and then um, we would analyze the scores, and I'll show that in a few minutes uh, in the interface. Uh, we also predict michaelis menten kinetics, uh, so we predict KM, Vmax, and clearance. Uh, these values are all related by this equation, so we have three individual models, but then we can bind each individual model and make sure that uh, it abides by this equation here. So this is much more more difficult uh, experiments to perform and to come up with the data because you're not looking at the disappearance of the compound, you're looking at the appearance of the metabolite and then uh, calculating those um, uh, individual properties. And of course, once you create models and once you have this data, uh, this can be used for drug-drug interactions uh, as well as um, uh, metabolism and, and looking at uh, oral bioavailability, et cetera and clearance of the molecule. Uh, so kind of putting all this uh, information together, uh, the first thing we do is we look at the model molecule, and we have what are called substrate, non-substrate models. And these uh, simply predict if the compound is a substrate for a particular isoform of cytochrome P450. Uh, so in this example, dilatazem, uh, we predict that it is a, a substrate for four out of the five major SIPs. So we predict that it's not a, um, a substrate for 1A2. Then uh, for the um, isoforms that are uh, the molecule is a substrate, we'll predict the sites of metabolism. And so here's an example of 3A4. You'd get similar ones for the other uh, three isoforms of which this compound is predicted to be a substrate. And these numbers here uh, in black are the output of the model. So uh, we would then go back uh, and analyze each one of these scores, and we would flag the compounds with the highest score. So these red uh, mesh circles uh, identify the sites of metabolism that are predicted by the model. And then these are non-sites. Uh, so you know, this score here, 442, is, it's, it's, you know, getting there, but it's not quite as high as this 861. Say if it was 700, then we might mark that as, as a site of metabolism. Uh, then for each one of the uh, sites of metabolism, we predict KM, Vmax, and clearance. 
uh, this simply shows the, the clearances. There would be uh, similar plots for KM and VMAX on this particular compound and this isoform. And then finally, we uh, actually predict the metabolites uh, and then display them in MedChem Designer. Uh, the display here looks at the overall clearance of the molecule and then each of the uh, individual isoforms uh, what their clearance would be to produce these individual products. Uh, if you sum up all the individual values, you get the total uh, clearance of the molecule, in this case 40.1 microliter per minute per milligrams of microsome protein. Uh, and then if you sum these two clearances and divide it by the overall clearance, you would get this percent value here. So we're predicting that kind of the major metabolite here is uh, this uh, dealkylation of the nitrogen. These models are also used in, in our DDI module in Gastro Plus. Uh, so here we show a graph of the fraction metabolized by SIPs uh, in the liver. And um, um, you might have other uh, systemic clearance in here. And then this is the fraction metabolized by SIPs uh, just in the gut. Um, so all the previous models I talked about were based on recombinant uh, SIPs. So this is an isolated uh, protein and the uh, predictions there. Uh, we also developed a model based on human liver microsomes and rat liver microsomal clearance. Uh, for the human liver microsomal clearance, we queried uh, Kemble and uh, extracted uh, uh, the data. Uh, then we had to go through a heavy curation process. And this was because Kemble kind of messed up the units on a lot of uh, the molecules. Uh, they like to use kilograms. And um, typically, when you see um, a clearance, typical units are microliter per minute per milligram of microsomal protein. Uh, so they would just, um, and then you'd see other units that might be per kilogram or per gram. Uh, those units, the kilogram is typically for overall body weight. Uh, so that would be very different from the milligrams of microsomal protein. And then uh, grams was typically the, the, the weight of the liver. Uh, and Kimball really kind of messed up these units. So we had to go back, extract the original journal article, check the values in the units, and then um, input the, the correct concentrations. Uh, there. Uh, we also, uh, then we converted all the data to milliliters or microliter per minute per milligram of microsomal protein, and we corrected for unbound fraction. So when you perform a, a liver microsomal um, experiment, measure the clearance, a number, uh, a portion of the molecule might bind to uh, the microsomes and therefore not be available to the enzymes to be uh, metabolized. And since these liver microsomes are kind of a, an artificial construct, uh, you're not really getting the true uh, metabolism or clearance of that compound. Uh, and so you have to correct for the percent unbound uh, to the microsomes. And this will vary from compound uh, to compound, and that's why we use uh, this FUMIC model that we created. Now, the FUMIC model um, uh, predicts uh, the fraction unbound at a concentration of one milligram per, micro, per milliliter of microsomal concentration. Now, the experiment might have been performed at a different concentration, and so we might have to adjust that value uh, in, by looking at the, the, the journal article. If no experimental value was given, then we assumed a half a milligram per milliliter. Uh, then we would compute the unbound clearance by dividing the uh, parent clearance uh, by the uh, predicted fraction unbound. And so we developed a model that predicts the unbound human liver microsomal clearance. Um, in the last year or so, we also created a rat liver microsomal clearance model following the similar procedure. And that's available in AtMet Predictor 9.0 now. OK, so let's. Um, uh, go into the program here and just show where some of these uh, show some of these predictions for uh, an example molecule and then I'm going to uh, show this molecule uh, in gastro plus after I uh, discuss gastro plus a little bit uh, so here is um, admet predictor and I've read uh, just a single molecule into it and so this is uh, a molecule that I just kind of made up 
uh, this core came from a publication and I just added uh, uh, some small rings onto this. So within AdMap Predictor, uh, the first thing you would do is calculate AdMap properties. Uh, if I click on this button, it'll bring up uh, this window here. And uh, that allows um, uh, one thing, you can change the uh, default pH. Uh, the default is 7.4. Uh, for, and if you change it to say two, uh, you would get things like log D and solubility calculated uh, at that particular value. Um, so uh, I'm going to calculate all the properties. Along with that, the molecular descriptors are calculated. So the molecular descriptors are calculated first, and then they're used to uh, in the models themselves to calculate, say, log P or log D, etc. Uh, so I'll just click calculate and you can see that uh, the program is very fast so it calculated over 300 descriptors for this molecule and then calculated over 140 models uh, from that uh, uh, molecule. So let's first uh, go into the uh, PhysChem properties so there's a tab down here that will just display the physical chemical uh, properties of the molecule. And the first thing we can look at is the, uh, the PKAs of this molecule. Uh, any uh, cell that is colored gray, we can double click on to bring up another window. And in this case, we would bring up the PKA microstates of the molecule. Uh, so if we start at the lowest uh, pH, the molecule is going to be fully protonated. And then as you increase the pH over here, uh, uh, one of these protons is going to come off. And so we're predicting that uh, this proton comes off first. So it has the uh, lowest pKa, and uh, that accounts for 61% of the molecules between this pH will be in uh, this particular uh, microstate. Uh, the other option here is to protonate this uh, nitrogen and leave this one unprotonated. Now these are very low pH and really aren't physically relevant. Uh, as you move above zero, uh, you get this positively charged uh, nitrogen in the uh, ring here, and that has a pK of about 7.8. Once you get above that, uh, you start generating more of this uh, neutral species. We can also plot uh, the fraction ionized versus the pH. Uh, each one of these um, uh, lines is for a different uh, microstate. Uh, we can also look at, uh, excuse me, the macrostate uh, in here. So if I move here, these are the macrostates. So these are the formally charged species. Uh, I can double click on the graph at a particular pH, and that will bring up a window that will show the uh, fraction ionized at a particular uh, pH. So at pH 7.34, most of the molecules about 74% in the positively charged state, 26% is in the neutral state. And there's various other plots we can uh, display based on these uh, predicted PKAs. Um, moving along here, we can uh, we have the log D of the compound. This is 2.86. Again, we can uh, double click on that to bring up a, a plot of the log D versus the pH. Uh, we can show where the pKa of this compound is uh, right up here um, at uh, a little bit above 7. And so you see that as uh, right around here, the log D starts to fall off uh, for this compound. Uh, as we move along, we have the PEF, which is about 4.9. And that is, uh, if we hover over the uh, title, that will show us what the uh, permeability predicted here is, and this is in centimeters per second times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, so that's 4.9 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters per second. Uh, here we have the aqueous water solubility, which is uh, about 40 um, micrograms per milliliter. Uh, the actual units here are milligrams per milliliter. We have the um, solubility at, or the, the, the pH of this compound for the saturated solution. Uh, so it's a basic compound, so it's uh, the value is 8.9 here. Uh, the intrinsic solubility, salt solubility factor, the solubility of pH uh, 7.4. And you see that this is 1.26. Uh, so this is um, at pH 7.4. Uh, is protonated, so this PA or this solubility is much higher than the uh, solubility at the, the higher pH. Uh, then we have FASIV and FASIV. Again, these are used in uh, GastroPlus. 
Um, then we have things like uh, the blood brain barrier uh, filter, uh, uh, fraction unbound to plasma in uh, humans and rats, uh, predicted volume distribution, ratio of, of uh, blood to plasma for both human and rat, uh, FMEC, and then some, again, some um, uh, uh, transporter uh, predictions here, classification models. If you see uh, something like uh, PGP inhibition, no, 96%. The value in parentheses is the uh, confidence we have in that prediction. So here it's uh, 96%. Uh, then these last models here are based on uh, this extended clearance classification system. Uh, so the ECCS here uh, is predicting this molecule to be in class two, which indicates that it is a um, its major metabolism is. Um, uh, or metabolism is this major clearance mechanism. This is a uh, binary or tertiary model, also predicts metabolism. And then we have uh, binary models that predict uh, this is cleared by metabolism, yes, uh, but not by renal uptake or renal or hepatic uptake. Uh, so those are all consistent uh, with each other. Now, um, the other thing we can show here is the uh, BCS. Uh, so under the tools, I drop down and we can display the um, biopharmaceutical classification system for this molecule at three different doses. So at 550 and 500 milligrams, uh, you'll see that this compound uh, goes from a class one uh, into a class two at the higher um, uh, dose levels. Uh, we can also change this to the uh, developability classification system. And here we have options to change to uh, the solubility. So I'm going to use the uh, uh, FASIF uh, solubility. And so you see in this particular one, the developability uh, at the lower doses, it's class one. As you go up to this uh, fairly high one at 500 uh, milligram, uh, it becomes uh, dissolution rate uh, limited, which means that uh, if you mill this uh, lower, you can get a higher um, uh, fraction absorbed for that compound. Uh, now moving on into the metabolism and describing some of those models. Uh, um, here are these uh, uh, um, SIP substrate uh, uh, clearance models are shown in what we call a, a star plot. And a star plot uh, just shows uh, or shows a wedge, and each one of these wedges represents a different uh, property. So this one represents the 1A2, uh, 2D, or 2C9, uh, 2C19, 2D6, and 3A4 models. So these are the five major um, uh, isoforms here, and it's predicting that this compound's just a substrate for 2D6 and 3A4. Uh, these are uh, minor, uh, a little bit less uh, minor isoforms. 2A6, 2B6, and 2C8 are also predicted uh, as uh, to metabolize this compound. Uh, then we get into the, the clearances, and then if this is a UGT substrate. Uh, the models are um, arranged by uh, SIP family. So the first uh, several uh, columns here are for 1A2. Uh, we also have model predictive this is inhibitor, uh, substrate, and we're seeing that it's a non-substrate for these. So if it's one of the five major isoforms, we also show KM, VMAX, and clearance. But since this is predicted to be a non-substrate, uh, we don't show uh, those values in here. The first compound or the first uh, isoform that this is predicted to be, or major isoform that is predicted to be a substrate of is 2D6. Uh, so again, I can double click on this and it will show the scores of the molecule. Uh, so these are the two sites of metabolism on this particular molecule for 2D6. Uh, we can also show KM, VMAX, and clearance. Uh, and these atomic properties are rectified together and then to produce the overall uh, 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 molecular clearance for these uh, uh, values here of KM, VMAX, and clearance. 
Um, and then if we go on further, we also have uh, 3A4, and then finally we have the HLM and RLM clearance predictions for this molecule, and those uh, can also be read into GastroPlus. Uh, if we double click on the mo molecule, we can bring up MedChem Designer. Uh, if we click on the metabol on the MET button, uh, this will produce the metabolite. So these values are related to the clearance. So these are from the uh, recombinant SIP values, uh, and so they're the clearance, overall clearance for this molecule, and then the individual clearance. And if you uh, have a good memory and we're, we're really uh, keen on the details, uh, when I popped up this, you saw that the clearance was 5.9 for this particular site and 9.4 uh, for the other site here. Uh, the 3A4 I didn't show, but what's happening here is that this position here is being hydroxylated that forms an unstable intermediate that falls apart into the aldehyde and the amino group here. Um, uh, MedChem Designer is also uh, installed automatically with Gastro Plus uh, 9.6, uh, so you can read your molecules into MedChem Designer, push the metabolism model, model uh, button, and show the metabolized, provided you have the admit predictor module uh, in Gastro Plus. Okay. So that's um, uh, AMAP predictor. Now let's go back uh, to the slides and uh, talk about uh, GastroPlus and how these are models are integrated into um, um, GastroPlus. Um, excuse me for one. I have to apologize. I'm, uh, just getting over a cold. So, um, so this next slide uh, talks about the um, uh, inter integration of the QSAR models with uh, PBPK. So basically the goal is to take a 2D structure of the molecule, uh, calculate various properties, and then perform a PBPK simulation of the compound. So the properties are calculated with quantitative structure activity relationships, which has been uh, the focus up to, of the talk up to this point. Uh, and now we'll show how these are integrated into GastroPlus to create uh, PBPK models. Uh, we also uh, use these for compartmental models. And of course, uh, out of this, you can get things like plasma concentration profiles. So this is in blue is the plasma concentration. Uh, in red, or excuse me, this green is the total um, um, uh, clearance for this uh, uh, this compound, uh, which is uh, uh, 2,4-D. Uh, here you have plots of um, uh, the urine output uh, here, uh, 100 milligrams for that, and then the concentration in lung, liver uh, are, are shown in these uh, uh, magenta, or excuse me, in the brown and uh, uh, green here for that. So those are the type plots you can get out. And the goal is to reliably and efficiently utilize PBPK modeling uh, to reduce animal and human testing. Uh, recently, a uh, paper by one of our, that was co, um, the first author is uh, now a Simulations Plus um, um, employee, Pankaj Daga. Uh, he postdoced at uh, Novartis and uh, developed methods uh, there for predicting the oral bioavailability of uh, discovery compounds. So here we're pushing discovery of PBPK modeling uh, down into the um, uh, discovery area to guide lead optimization. And so these P two uh, papers discuss that. Uh, for the AdMap predictor module, so this is a particular module in GastroPlus that you can purchase. Uh, if you purchase AdMap predictor standalone, which I just uh, demonstrated, and get the PhysChem uh, biopharmaceutical and uh, metabolism modules, then you automatically get this module uh, for free in GastroPlus here. Uh, so this allows you to automatically create a GastroPlus database that contains estimates of PKA, solubility, biorelevant solubility, uh, et cetera, all these properties listed on here, along with the SIP uh, metabolism kinetics. So the way uh, these are imported into uh, GastroPlus uh, is through the uh, import dialog box. And all these models are 
uh, contained in the Gastro Plus uh, distribution files. So you don't have to separately install Admin Predictor. All of them will be available uh, within Gastro Plus just by installing Gastro Plus. Uh, so over on the left, we have the uh, physical chemical properties, and by default, these are all uh, predicted. Now, when I read in a structure file, if I have data in, in the file, such as this uh, particular example here, would I have data in the file, these uh, pull-down menus become activated. And so you can read in, if you have experimental log D value, you can read that in. Uh, along with the structure and used experimental values uh, for some of these instead of the, the predicted values. Uh, the formulation parameters are also uh, can be uh, modified or input into uh, this form. So these are the uh, formulation conditions for your compound, what the dosage form is, the, the dose. And you see this is highlighted in red. So this was an example of when I read this input file, it had a column called dose GP, uh, which was the dose. So you can um, read in different doses uh, for, for the compounds. Down here, we would have observed values. Uh, again, this uh, uh, particular um, data file had the observed fraction, uh, uh, fraction absorbed and the oral bioavailability within it. Um, moving on, uh, over on the right, upper right, uh, here's where you specify the pharmacokinetics and physiology. Uh, so you can use a compartmental model or define a particular physiology. Uh, the gut physiology, uh, then again here, these are predictions from ADMET predictor along with the uh, volume of distribution. And this is a, a prediction from Gastro Plus, which is used within the compartmental model. Uh, with a compartmental model, uh, you don't enter a, a, a renal clearance, uh, and then down here is where you would uh, specify what models uh, you wanted to use from ADMAP predictor. And so the choices are here, you could use recombinant uh, SIPs to predict the KM and VMAX, uh, or you could choose to use different clearance models. So one of them would be the uh, HLM clearance, uh, you can also use sums of the uh, individual clearances from the different uh, recombinant SIPs uh, in here. And, you know, each one of these might give different uh, uh, fraction absorbs and produce different models uh, from there. Um, and this just mentions you don't, you want to use either VM and KMAX or uh, intrinsic clearance, not both. Okay. And then there's a model that I haven't talked about that uh, is actually 3A4 data, uh, but it's based on HLM, so that's a, a different type model there. Okay, so now let's get into uh, Gastro Plus. Uh, so let me just kind of minimize the um, window here, and uh, then I'll do some comparisons of uh, the properties, show that the properties in AdMet Predictor are the same that they are in um, uh, Gastro Plus. So, uh, this is Gastro Plus, and I've just uh, started with a, an empty database. So I created a new database, and of course that creates a, a blank record. Uh, I'm sorry, is there a question? Okay, let me let me keep going then. Um, so here we would simply do uh, an import of a new compound. So we go down file, and then go down to import structure, and then specify the uh, input file. And here it's just a simple um, uh, smiles file. This has just a single molecule in it. Uh, and so when I double click on it, it brings up the uh, the interface that I just showed or the dialog box. Uh, that I just showed. Uh, so these are all grayed out because it can only use predictive values. There's no input values uh, in this um, uh, particular uh, data set or particular file. Uh, so here I'm going to specify that I'm going to use um, um, a compartmental model. And um, uh, uh, then the other thing I'm going to specify is to use uh, the HLM model. So it's going to use the uh, human liver microsomal model uh, for the uh, liver clearance. 
and then I would simply click OK. And you'll notice that this uh, briefly changed to admet predictor where it was predicting the properties. This first uh, record is the blank record and so I'm going to delete that uh, record and then we only have the uh, single record uh, in here. Uh, so over on the left we see the molecular weight calculated, uh, the log D of, uh, uh, or excuse me, the log P of 2.89 and uh, we'll just quickly show that over uh, here in this uh, uh, dialog box here where we show the uh, log P of 2.886, which would round up to 2.89. Uh, we can also display the PKA table. So if we click on this button here, we have the PKAs from uh, AdMet Predictor. And let me blow this up a little bit. Uh, then we have the solubility versus pH uh, profile for this particular compound. Uh, we can also display the log P. And um, this has been in Gastro Plus for a long time. The ones I showed in AdMet Predictor were just uh, uh, input into this new newest version of uh, AdMet Predictor. Um, moving on, um, uh, let's see. I'll show that the enzyme table is blank because we didn't read in any KMV max values. So uh, for this particular compound, uh, or for the HLM clearance, there won't be any uh, KMV max values going into there. Uh, the uh, uh, pH uh, for the reference solubility and the solubility is shown here, 0.04. And again, that uh, uh, is directly correlates with the, 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 the property in, in uh, AVAP predictor. So I'm just trying to show that these values are identical here uh, uh, in the standalone versus versus uh, gastro plus. Um, then if we go down to the notes section down here, I know this is probably hard to read, but uh, we have the ECCS classification system here. Uh, then we have some other models with, that are in AdMet predictor. So the tendency to supersaturate, the likelihood of uh, penetrating the blood-brain barrier, uh, if it's a PGP or a substrate or inhibitor, and also an OTB1B1 uh, inhibitor. Now, even though some of these models, uh, for example, the OTP1B1 uh, is an inhibitor model, uh, a lot of the inhibitors are also substrates. So if your molecule is predicted to be an inhibitor, uh, you might also consider that there's some active uptake uh, into the liver by OATP1B1. Uh, it also shows the um, RBP and FUP calculations here. Uh, we also calculate that for human and rat, and this is simply showing that the uh, human values are uh, input into this um, uh, record of gastro plus. Uh, now if we go into the um, uh, pharmacokinetics, we'll see that we're doing a compartmental model of body weight of 70 kilograms, and then we have first pass uh, extraction. Again, these are based on the in silico properties. Uh, we have the fraction absorbed, or excuse me, the um, uh, uh, FUP in plasma, and then the adjusted FUP um, from uh, Gastro Plus. Uh, this volume of uh, distribution here, 7.86, is a prediction from uh, AdMet Predictor. Again, this will be in this table here uh, in this particular column. And then the T1 half here, uh, the, the tooltip here shows that it's uh, 20 hours. So we're predicting a pretty high um, uh, T1 half for this compound, and that's calculated from uh, the log log two times the volume of distribution divided by the clearance, and then also multiplied for the, the, the body weight so that it's in uh, uh, hours. So now let's just go over to the simulation and just start a simulation. And you'll see that this compound, um, uh, the fraction absorbed and the FDP are the same, and that's because there's no metabolism occurring in the, the gut wall. Uh, for the fraction absorbed, uh, or excuse me, the oral bioavailability is predicted to be 73% uh, percent here. And then we can go in the graph tab and show that this uh, compound gets absorbed uh, into systemic circulation, reaches a peak around here, and then uh, is slowly um, uh, eliminated 
uh, from there. Okay, so that's a, a compartmental model. Uh, now let's go back in and um, uh, import um, uh, the molecule again, but this time instead of doing a compartmental model, let's do a PBPK model. So I'll go back into File, uh, Import, Import Structure, import this same compound, uh, get the similar type dialog box. This time I'm going to use um, um, healthy male American, 35-year-old uh, uh, physiology, 86 kilograms. Uh, and this I've already uh, was already defined in this database, so I can simply select it here. Uh, that then uh, converts the renal filtration to FUP times GFR. Uh, so that's how the uh, renal clearance is handled. And again, I'm going to set this up for the, the HLM uh, uh, model to use that predictions in here. So I click on uh, OK to bring this into uh, AdMap Predictor, or excuse me, into Gastro Plus, and then I'll shift to the second um, 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 record. All these values will be the same because they're all uh, calculated from various uh, properties in the AdMap Predictor. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so. Excuse me, I have to. Okay, so now let's go to the uh, pharmacokinetics uh, tab. And so the difference here you'll see is that now we have uh, the individual KPs for the various uh, tissues and organs within the body, uh, clearance associated with that, uh, the intrinsic clearance, and then the fraction unbound. And so these KP values will be used to calculate the mechanistic uh, uh, volume of uh, or the steady state volume of distribution. Uh, and here these units are simply in liters uh, rather than liters per kilogram here. Uh, the clearance value here uh, is 17.7. That's shown in uh, the liver. Uh, so what happened is that it imported the human liver microsomal clearance, uh, which is the in vitro experimental value. Uh, this is then converted to um, uh, an intrinsic clearance uh, in in vivo, and then the well stirred model is used to convert this into the uh, uh, clearance for this particular tissue in liters per hour. And this would include the blood flow, whereas this did not include the blood flow um, value here. And then this systemic circular, our uh, systemic clearance here is the sum of the liver clearance and then the, the renal clearances, which is 1.8. So that gives a total of uh, 19.5. Now, if we go into the simulation model and simply click on um, um, start, uh, this again predicts a, um, the same FA and FDP of about 100%. So this molecule is well absorbed uh, at this particular dose. And then the oral bioavailability is 76%. Uh, and then this shows a graph. So this particular graph goes up higher and falls off a little bit quicker than it did uh, in the previous simulation, which was just based on um, the compartmental model. Uh, so this considers all the tissues uh, in the body and also can, uh, includes the um, uh, renal clearance. Okay, now the third time I'm going to import this again, and instead of using a linear clearance, I'm going to use the KM and Vmax values. Uh, so again, I'm going to need to uh, use a PBPK model in order to um, be able to define that um, these enzymes in the gut wall uh, and the liver. Uh, and so then down here, I'm going to choose uh, all our SIPs and then turn off the uh, uh, clearance. Uh, so then I, again, click OK uh, to import this into uh, Gastro Plus and then navigate to the uh, last record here, which is the third record in the data set. Uh, and then now we'll note if we click on the enzyme table that we have uh, values for 2D6 and 3A4. So these were the uh, enzymes that are predicted to metabolize the compound. Uh, and you'll also notice that we have a, a field here for the metabolite. Uh, so if we had entered the metabolites of this compound, we could select them in, in this menu, and that would um, 
and then we could track the metabolites uh, for this compound. So that's another advantage of using uh, the KM and Vmax values here um, within the table. Um, now, if we go over to the uh, gut meta or the, the gut uh, uh, tab, you'll see that there's columns for 3A4 and 2D6. So this will define the uh, metabolism within the, the, the gut wall there. Um, now, if we go over to the pharmacokinetics tab, uh, this will be similar to the um, previous one where we just did a PBPK model. Uh, you'll get a little different um, uh, values here. Now, since we're using KM and Vmax, there's not an entry for the liver. Uh, so this is just for the renal clearance here. Uh, so if I go back in here and do a simulation this time, uh, we're going to get different predictions because um, we're allowing for gut metabolism. Uh, and so here you see the fraction absorbed is almost 100%. FDP is down to 88%. And this is due to uh, 2D6 and 3A4 that are uh, in the gut wall. And then once it gets on the other side of the liver, uh, its oral bioavailability is only uh, 49%. And again, we can look at uh, the plot, which this looks similar to the, the one for the uh, HLM clearance uh, from record two. Okay, so then just in a final example, I'm going to re-import the molecule, uh, but this time I'm going to use the, um, uh, I'm going to specify a rat physiology. So here I'm going to use a, a 250 gram rat, and um, then down here I'm going to use HLM. Now, really, I'll show you that when this is imported, it's actually using uh, the, um, um, uh, rat predictions. And so this record here, or the notes down here, indicate that rat prediction saved in the database. Uh, so it shows the rat prediction, uh, or it says that the rat predictions are used because the physiology is rat, and then uh, also shows the values for uh, uh, these values. Now, uh, for the rat, I'm going to reduce the uh, dose to two milligrams. Uh, again, we can go to the pharmacokinetics tab. Uh, and um, since we're using uh, linear clearance, uh, it'll show the clearances in here uh, for the liver. And then I can start this and uh, do a simulation. Here it's predicting about 70% uh, of the compound uh, for the oral bioavailability. And again, we can create the graph here. Uh, so that's the uh, demonstration portion of the um, a webinar, and then finally, I just want to summarize uh, in this final slide, uh, discussed uh, uh, the big picture for Gastro Plus, all the inputs, uh, talked in detail about our QSPR and QSAR models, uh, the, both the physical, chemical, and biopharmaceutical modules, along with the cytochrome P450 metabolism uh, module, and then finally demonstrated how these uh, models are integrated to allow you to perform PBPK and compartmental model just based on the 2D structure of the model. Uh, and that's always a good starting point for any um, um, project you're going to do is just do the, the um, in vivo or the, excuse me, the in silico predictive properties and use that as a, a base model. So uh, I want to thank you for your time and now I'll turn it back over to John DeBella. Thank you, Michael. Uh, once again, if you'd like to ask a question using your telephone, please use the hand raising icon on your control panel and be sure to enter your unique audio pin uh, or use the questions pane on your control panel to type one in. So we'll open it up now for questions and see if anybody has anything on what Michael had presented today. So a question has come in, uh, and this is one that I may take. Um, do you have prediction models for dermal absorption? Uh, how a compound can potentially reach various skin layers, skin metabolism and clearance, uh, either to systemic circulation or to the lymphatic circulation. Uh, the answer to that is yes, uh, though it is not part of the ADMET predictor standalone program or module in GastroPlus. 
it is actually part of Gastro Plus and what we call the additional dosage routes module. Uh, let me just quickly open up a presentation uh, just to cover it uh, or introduce it briefly. We won't have time to go into uh, the details today. Okay, and I will take from Michael the uh, presentation privileges. We see your uh, slides now. Okay. So um, in Gastro Plus, we do have a mechanistic dermal absorption model that was originally developed uh, in collaboration with GlaxoSmithKline about seven years ago. Uh, what we've done is we've taken a typical cross-section of the skin and separated it into several compartments, uh, the major compartments of the skin, uh, and then allowed users to set up the um, administration. Uh, if it's a topical dose, uh, define some of the vehicle properties, define some of the um, application properties like surface area and uh, washout time. And within the vehicle layer, what we would do is model the release or dissolution of the API from that formulation, uh, potentially model any precipitation effects that might be taking place. And if the vehicle is, um, uh, if the solvent is not stable, then there could be some evaporation taking place into the air. Uh, what we ultimately hope to see in many cases is for the API material to absorb uh, from the vehicle into the top layer of the skin, the stratum corneum, uh, and then diffuse through uh, the stratum corneum into the viable epidermis, dermis layers. Uh, we also account for the sebum and hair follicles as well. Uh, and within certain compartments, we may have uh, metabolism taking place or local clearance in the skin. Uh, and we also would have uh, the absorption taking uh, place in the, into the bloodstream, uh, the systemic circulation, or through the lymphatic circulation. And so we refer to this model in Gastro Plus as the TCAT model. TCAT stands for transdermal compartmental absorption and transit. Uh, with what you can do in the TCAT model is um, select the dosing region. Uh, you can see for humans and mini pigs, we have six different sites that can be defined. And then we also have models for the rat and mouse, which would represent the whole body skin. The program will then provide you with the physiological conditions for the TCAT model. Uh, that would be things like the skin thickness layer, um, the blood flow rates, um, the composition of the skin uh, in terms of volume fractions of um, proteins and, and lipids, and then what we can do is go into the vehicle compartment and start setting up our formulation and application. And you can see the various connections between the vehicle and the various skin and hair compartments. The blue lines represent the connections to the systemic circulation. The pink line represents the connection to the lymphatic circulation. And then we uh, utilize the FDA guidelines when defining the dosage forms or formulations that can be simulated. Uh, and you can see here in this table, the list of different dosage form options in Gastro Plus with the TCAP model, uh, what each of these dosage forms represent, and uh, what type of information you as a user would need to provide. 
and there has been uh, work that was done uh, through one of the major European consortium groups called Cosmetics Europe, uh, where they evaluated different uh, dermal skin absorption models uh, from different software programs and using some of their data. It was around 25 drugs and chemicals where they had measured the skin penetration uh, from phosphate buffer and ethanol formulations in vehicles. And what they found when comparing uh, the different models was that Gastro Plus did the best compared to other software programs. Um, and it was because of this where we are now um, entering into uh, more formal collaborations with Cosmetics Europe on further development of this TCAP model. And there are many other case studies and examples that um, we can share afterwards. If you're interested, uh, please uh, reach out to our distributors at Electrolab. Uh, they will have copies of the posters and presentation slides. Going back to the questions, another one has come in. Um, about a separate module for IV-IV correlations. Um, yes, um, GastroPlus does have a robust IV-IVC correlation module to it. Um, let me open up another uh, set of slides here to just briefly talk about that. So um, the IV IVC plus module in Gastro Plus, um, it allows you to build um, level A IV IVCs uh, using either traditional or mechanistic deconvolution methods. Uh, you may be familiar with what we call traditional approaches like Wagner-Nelson, Lou Riegelman, uh, numerical deconvolution, where what it is that we are um, fitting or deconvoluting is the in vivo bioavailability versus time profile, how much drug reached the systemic circulation. And then we're trying to correlate that in vivo bioavailability to uh, the in vitro dissolution versus time profile. And that's where we then set up our IV IVC or for working with just a single formulation and in vitro and vivo relationship, IV IVR. Um, Gastro Plus also has um, what we call the mechanistic deconvolution approach. <clears throat> and I can illustrate what the differences are here. Um, let me go into the slideshow mode. So um, Michael showed this slide earlier uh, where we have the various um, compartments set up in the software to model dissolution and absorption, first pass metabolism, and ultimately the bioavailability and distribution into the systemic circulation. With a mechanistic IV IVC, uh, what we're going to be deconvoluting is the actual dissolution versus time along the lumen of the GI tract. And then separately, we would be tracking the absorption of the compound from the bioavailability. Now, the traditional methods like Wagner-Nelson, Lou Riegelman, and so on, uh, they are going to be deconvoluting the amount of drug that reaches the systemic circulation, which is the bioavailability profile. So with a traditional approach, we have no idea what's happening over here. We have no idea whether or not our formulation is uh, releasing or dissolving completely 
and we have some issues with absorption or first pass metabolism. Uh, we don't know if there is maybe incomplete release um, with no absorption issues. We have no idea whether or not the in vivo dissolution of our product is at all correlated to the actual in vitro release. All we ultimately know is how much of the drug reaches the bloodstream. So with a mechanistic approach, what we can do is pull back um, the curtain and separately identify and track the dissolution from the absorption from the bioavailability. And um, just to skip ahead here, I believe I have, uh, sorry, it's in a different presentation real quick. Let me just open that one up. We'll see how good my memory is going through all of the different presentations that I have. I'm looking for one set of slides in particular, and I know I'll find it here real soon. So thank you for your patience. Um, so um, the FDA, uh, published an article about six years ago uh, where they wanted to compare um, IV IVCs uh, generated using traditional methods in GastroPlus. And this is for class one drug uh, extended release polymer matrix formulations. And so in the publication, you can see the reference here, they had some reference and test product data. Uh, they built some models in GastroPlus. They used traditional approaches to build the IVIVC, and then they used the mechanistic approach. And um, what they ultimately found was when they did the internal validation of the IVIVCs, uh, they saw similar prediction accuracy. So using the same products, that were used to build the IVIVC to validate it, the accuracy of the predicted CMAX and AUCs were similar between the traditional and mechanistic approaches. However, the mechanistic approaches in GastroPlus showed greater prediction accuracy for the new products that were not used to build the IVIVCs. So the external validation was more accurate with the mechanistic approaches in GastroPlus. And um, we have been, uh, I think I have the slides here somewhere as well, or maybe not. Sorry, I don't have the slides here. Um, but we've also, um, entered into a five-year collaboration with the FDA on um, further validation of this mechanistic deconvolution approach. Uh, so there is a lot of interest at the FDA in terms of understanding and identifying situations where mechanistic deconvolutions um, would be superior to the, to the traditional approaches. And it seems like the focus will be on BCS class three and four drugs where historically traditional IVIVC uh, methods have not been successful. And again, if there's um, interest in learning a little bit more about the uh, IVIVC approaches, uh, our colleagues at Electro Labs can follow up with you. 
Um, another question that has come in is um, about predictive models that can predict steady state PK based upon single uh, dose oral administration. Uh, yes, we have um, software like that. Uh, Gastro Plus could be used uh, in a situation like that. Uh, Gastro Plus has the ability to um, simulate for both single and multiple dose administrations. Uh, but there is a uh, another program that uh, would be, I think, even more interesting and that is uh, what we call PK plus. And so let me just briefly open up a presentation to talk about PK plus. Um, so PK plus is a program that is similar to uh, tools like Phoenix Win Nonlin, uh, except it provides you with the functionality, the the absolute functionality that you need to perform non-compartmental and compartmental uh, PK modeling activities. Uh, and now we've added in the ability to do simulations as well for steady state uh, exposure levels. And the software is all available at a price point which is significantly lower compared to other similar software. And so PK Plus provides you with everything that you would need uh, in terms of utilizing the program within a 21 CFR Part 11 compliant uh, workflow or system set up at your company. Uh, and it has all of the major um, prediction, uh, excuse me, modeling activities uh, or functionality for both non-compartmental and compartmental approaches. And then, as mentioned, we now have the ability to do predictions as well with PK Plus using non parametric superpositioning or multi dose simulations. So, what you would be able to do with PK Plus is use some single dose oral PK data. And I'm going to skip ahead here a few slides. Uh, again, happy to send the presentations over to you afterwards. But um, what you would be able to do is utilize the single um, dose data sets that you have to define your non-compartmental parameters. And using non-parametric superpositioning, you can predict multi -dose, uh, multiple dose outputs uh, and steady state levels. Uh, and you can also do this with um, the... PK simulation functionality as well. If I've set up a one, two, or three compartment model, I would be able to then define what my uh, dose regimen is going to be and run simulations out for some length of time to predict and capture what the steady state levels would be. And I can calculate from there partial AUCs, uh, Cmax levels, uh, peak trough ratios and so on. So all of my statistics can be calculated as well uh, utilizing uh, the full PK simulations within PK+. Um, another question can, uh, can Gastro Plus be used to support Support uh, formulation disproportionality between different strengths? Um, sure, the answer is yes, uh, especially for internal research purposes. Now, whether it can be used to support uh, waiving of studies and uh, regulatory interactions for uh, different strengths is a question that will depend upon. Um, different factors. If um, we were able to assume that the composition of the formulation uh, was the same and that the only differences were with the um, 
amount of API in the formulations, then there would be a, a fairly good chance that you would be able to utilize Gastro Plus, uh, build models at a certain dose strength, um, potentially build IV IVCs or IV IVRs, and then do predictions at uh, different strengths and predict uh, disproportionality. Um, and then have that information be compiled into a report for re review by regulatory agencies. If the composition of the formulations, though, differ uh, in terms of the amounts of excipients, for example, or the technology that is being used, uh, there may be more questions that are asked by the reviewers at the regulatory agencies especially if we're trying to apply some IV IVCs from uh, the existing data that we have and then predicting what the uh, PK levels are likely to be for these new products which have different compositions, which have different technologies. Um, there would be a lot of assumptions that I'm not sure the reviewers at uh, the regulatory agencies would be willing to accept at this time. Uh, but it could still be very helpful for you internally at your company to help kind of guide the strategy that you decide to take as you move forward. So I think it, it all depends on how similar the um, non-API factors are with your formulations in terms of whether or not your simulation results would uh, be reviewed favorably by the regulatory agencies for um, different dose strengths. Uh, but it is something that um, uh, some companies have begun to evaluate, especially within the context of IV IVCs. Uh, another question related to IV IVCs is um, in case of traditional IV IVCs, um, per the FDA's guidance, there's a minimum of three batches which are required with different release rates and external and internal validation is mandatory. Um, how many validations should be submitted to the agency in case of you're using mechanistic approaches? Um, the same would apply. Um, and one area that you do have to be a little bit careful about if you're using the mechanistic approaches um, is that right now does seem like the FDA has a policy for IV IVCs where the first step is that the deconvolutions are performed on individual subjects. So using individual subject PK data, you would perform the deconvolution activities, and then you would take the average of all of those individual subject uh, deconvolution profiles uh, and use that average to build the correlation to the in vitro dissolution data. Doing individual subject deconvolutions with a mechanistic approach can be a time-consuming step. Gastro Plus can do it, uh, but it can be a time-consuming, tedious operation today. It's not really designed yet for working with individual subject data. Uh, that's something that we'll be addressing in the version 10 of Gastro Plus that will be released uh, towards the end of next year. Um, so that would be the one area that I would um, caution you on is if you're considering using a mechanistic IV IVC for regulatory purposes, the same requirements are going to apply as, as are in place today for traditional approaches where three products uh, try and do internal and external validation and also have to consider using individual subject data to perform the deconvolution step. So the same um, guideline requirements are in place whether you're using mechanistic or traditional approaches. But I will caution you that the mechanistic approaches 
uh, will take more time to, to perform. Um, another question is about the integration between DDD plus and AdMet predictor. Um, could it help with generating better dissolution predictions for formulations? So that's a, that's a good question. Michael um, demonstrated the kind of theory and approaches that we use for building these AI or machine learning models um, from AdMet Predictor that then go into GastroPlus. The key inputs that would be required for DDD plus simulations like PKAs and the aqueous solubility versus pH profile and biorelevant solubilities and diffusion coefficient. Um, that will give you a very good foundation starting point for your simulation activities. Now, I think Michael mentioned this, but I just want to emphasize it. Um, even though our livelihood as a company is based upon modeling and simulation technology, we'll be the first to admit that if you can generate in vitro experimental data, uh, for the key physical chemical properties, do that and use it as the input into your gastro plus or DDD plus models. So I don't want to mislead you and say that uh, the structure based predictions are better than your measured results. If you have measured data, use the measured data. Uh, but we always encourage users to start any project in Gastro Plus or DDD Plus with the chemical structure predictions so that you have this very good foundation um, that you can build upon as the experimental data is being generated. And if you can't generate the data for certain properties, uh, then you have these in silico estimates that you can use to fill in any gaps. So, I would encourage you to start any DDD plus projects by importing the chemical structure and using those models from AdMet Predictor to generate the in silico estimates. But if you do have uh, the ability to generate measured data, by all means also do that as well. Um, another question uh, in case of steady state simulations with PK plus, is it a mathematical simulation like win nonlin or mechanistic simulation? Um, it depends on the method. So just coming back here, and that's, that's a good question, um, coming back to the slides. So if we use the uh, non-parametric superposition approach, uh, that is just a mathematical transition uh, or transformation. Uh, so there are basic uh, transform functions that can be used. Uh, we can calculate from a single uh, oral dose or IV dose profile, the non-compartmental parameters, and then just apply those with some transform functions to generate the steady state profile. So the non-parametric superposition approach is a mathematical transformation. The compartmental PK simulations though, those would be more mechanistic. Um, these will require that you actually utilize a compartmental PK model. So a one, two, or three compartment model. And then within the context of that compartmental PK system, the program would utilize um, ordinary differential equations and with your dosing regimen that you define down here, uh, it would run a simulation. Now we are not using the, um, in any way here in PK plus, the gastro plus ACAP model or any mechanistic absorption model, you would be using, and I know it's hard to see here, but you can see we would be using 
a fitted constant Ka for the absorption rate, and then using our parameters for the systemic distribution and elimination to describe the one, two, or three compartment system. But we are tracking the changes in the concentrations with time using the differential equations that make up a compartmental model. And with this compartmental PK simulation, um, the dosing regimen here, it's set up similar to the mixed multiple dose support files in GastroPlus, which allows you to utilize non-fixed doses or dose intervals. So you would be able to set up here, for example, that you're going to have an oral 50 milligram dose at time zero, and then maybe six hours hours later, a 100 milligram dose, maybe 24 hours later, a 500 milligram dose. So you can mix and match doses and dose intervals um, when you're working with a mechanistic simulation in PK+. <clears throat> and our last question, uh, we're coming up here to the, to the end of the webinar, the two hour mark is uh, can virtual bioequivalence be done with the steady state simulations performed by PK plus? Uh, good question, um, not yet. Uh, it's something that we're considering putting into the software. Um, you know, one thing that you could do though is from PK plus, um, you know, you could potentially export the predicted steady state profile uh, and then go into GastroPlus and load that profile into what we call the OPD support file. And then in GastroPlus, there is a very nice um, virtual bio, bioequivalence calculation engine that you could use to then perform the calculation in GastroPlus. Uh, but we do not yet have the ability in PKPlus to do the virtual BE calculations something that we'll, uh, we'll consider adding in a future version. So I think that will now wrap up today's webinar. Um, I want to again thank Michael for, for the excellent and insightful uh, presentation that he gave today. Um, as a reminder, the playback will be available online at our resource center. Um, and also for more information on ADMET Predictor, Gastro Plus, PK Plus, or DDD Plus, or any other product or service that's offered by Simulations Plus, we do encourage you to visit our website, www.simulations-plus.com, and also uh, reach out to our distributors in India, uh, Electrolab India. Uh, we will uh, make sure that they have the registration details for those of you who attended today, and they will reach out to you uh, with the requested information, the ADMET predictor, PK+, plus, Gastro Plus dermal slides, and so on. Also, if you haven't yet, be sure to connect with us on one of our social media channels, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, YouTube and also the Gastro Plus user group on LinkedIn, which has over 1,000 members for the latest news and company events. So thank you again for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day and a nice weekend coming up. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.